Today we are performing a total knee replacement using navigation technology with ligamentous balancing. I open the wound, skin and the subcutaneous tissue. This layer is called the colles fascia. It's a very important layer. I take it off separately as it can be used as a good layer to be repaired after the closure. I do medial parapatella approach. I incise the tissue inferior to the patella vertically. I use sharp dissection in this approach until I get to the joint. We remove some of the fat. This is a varus knee which is presenting the majority of osteoarthritis of knee. I use a hormone medially to identify the medial structures at the proximal tibia. I gently dissect the tissue superiorly. You can see there is a significant amount of osteophytes. I then reflect the patella. And with gentle flexion, you can see the patella is reflected laterally. I remove the fat pad. Gently removing the fat pad would cause no damage to the patella tendon. Be mindful of lateral genicular vessels at this level. There is an anterior branch that would bleed. This operation is performed without the use of tourniquets. Hormon retractors, I position it at the back of the knee and a second one medially, just under the medial collateral ligament and I gently dislocate the knee anteriorly. It's very important to protect the medial collateral ligament. The deep part of the medial collateral ligament will be sacrificed. The ACL will be sacrificed, so as the PCL. I remove the osteophyte using a saw. You can see here we removed all the osteophyte from the medial proximal tibia. We reduce the knee and attend to the femoral side. I use a saw to remove the osteophyte from the femur. We remove the femoral osteophyte. I do the same on the lateral side. We have to dissect the PCL in order to achieve full balancing. We then move to patellar resection. I perform freehand patellar resection. There is an even resection of the patella. Now that all the bony preparation has been achieved, we move to the navigation guide. I choose separate incisions for the navigation guide. I choose separate incisions for the navigation guide. Insertion of the navigation guide has to be very gentle and slow. We insert the navigation beacons. We make sure that the beacon is registered by the computer in all angles. This is very vital to proceed with the surgery. We start with our navigation registration. First is the posterior medial condyle, lateral medial condyle, anterior surface edema, medial tibial plateau, lateral tibial plateau, ACL insertion, medial malleolus, lateral malleolus, the center of the ankle, and then the hip center. Then the knee center, and the knee rotation, external rotation, and internal rotation. The next is a thematic diagram showing us where the knee is flexing and extending with the amount of ligamentous laxity. So you can see throughout the range, this knee is going through 5 to 10 degrees of varus and has 4 degrees fixed flexion deformity and it can flex to 115 degrees. With taking these measures, the computer will calculate how much resection we have to perform. We start our bony cuts. First, we position our retractors to protect the soft tissue. It's a tibia first ligamentous balance knee replacement. The resection, there are 9 millimeters from the lateral side, 6 millimeters from the medial side, and zero varus valgus, zero slope. We perform the tibia resection. We check the amount of tibia that we resected. The amount of tibia resection is sufficient. The resection is exactly as we wanted it. Now we move to checking the femoral distal section and identify the varus valgus of the distal femur. And it looks like it's 4 degrees valgus. We move to the femoral sizing, which is dependent on the anterior surface of the femur, and it's reading around 5. The next step is moving to the ligamentous balancing section. The knee is held from the heel, and we gently balance by 
Stretching the laminate spreader gradually until we get the amount of tension that we require. This is a steel procedure. I'm happy with that. Then we do the same balancing in 90 degrees of flexion. This next step is very important. The screen looks very messy. And as you can see, it gives us the size of the implant, the size of the meniscal spacer or plastic, the distal cut of the femur, the orientation of the distal femur in extension, the amount of cut medially and laterally in the distal femur, the amount of cut from the tibia, the flexion of the femoral component, the rotation of the femoral component, the balance in flexion between the tibia and the femur, and the amount of cut of the posterior condyles of the femur. All of these are taking into account the bony resection as well as the ligamentous balancing. Though this screen looks like it is well sized, I don't have much room to play with. So I will decrease the size of the femur to size 5. This will open the gap in flexion. As you can see, there is 6 millimeter gap. I will increase the femoral cut by 2. So that will increase the distal cut to 2 millimeters. I will flex the femoral component to 3 degrees and that will decrease my flexion gap. This will give me a much better balancing with less size femoral component than size 6 as in my opinion size 6 will be overstuffing this considering that the patient is a female. The reason I chose to have smaller size femur is because of my preoperative templating and intraoperative sizing of the femur. This patient will be more suitable to have size 5 component than size 6 on the AP dimension as well as the medial lateral dimensions. We move to the next step which is the femoral resection. The cuts are telling me that the distal femur cut is at zero level, flexion at three level and the gap will be one millimeter. that the femoral resection is exactly at the notch and now we move to the four and one block. On the medial lateral dimension, the size five looks very optimal. I'm satisfied with this cut. The distal femoral cut is at zero the varus valgus. The tibial cut is at zero varus valgus. The gap is sufficient. The joint line is at zero and the femoral component is flexed at two degrees. I go with the saw from medial to lateral to avoid notching. step we remove the bony cut, we remove the posterior osteophytes. After the removal of the osteophyte we check for any bleeders. So I gradually take the knee into extension and look for the bleeders. Since I'm satisfied that there are no bleeders, I move to insert the tibial trial, we go for the keel. The femoral trial is inserted next, and finally the spacer. The patient knee flexion extension is measured, and you can see the tracking is all within one degree. That's very satisfactory. And the knee is stable in flexion. I'm happy with the position of the trial. We proceed to the definitive implant. We use the men's gun technique with vacuum mixing. The implant has tibial component with a keel, a plastic spacer, and the femoral component. What you notice is that the implant is gold in color. This is due to the coating material that's used for this implant, which is a type of ceramic coating. Pressurization with the gun. As you can see, bubbles are coming out. The tibial component is impacted gently. The excess cement is removed. The tibial surface is clean from any kind of platter of blood and debris. And then the plastic component is inserted. The knee joint is reduced. 
all of this process is well done without the need of using a tourniquet. Tourniquet application does not add any benefit, in my opinion, to this procedure unless there is excessive bleeding. Considering the risks associated with tourniquets. The femoral component is then inserted. The knee joint, after final infection of the femoral component, is taken through range. Removal of excess of cement is performed. Then we need to position the patella. Check the tracking of the knee, and we can see that throughout the tracking, it's within two degrees of varus to zero. This is very good tracking of the knee. Closure is a standard wound closure, watertight to the capsule and the other layers. Thank you very much.